Uh, good afternoon, Lee Harris. Uh, pleased to be here on behalf of the Joint Task Force. Uh, as you know, since the pandemic began, we have worked really hard to mitigate the risk of spread of COVID-19, to reduce our hospital strain, and to um, uh, reduce the number of lives that are put in jeopardy. In addition to that, a lot of other kinds of issues have emerged over the last 10 or 11 months. One uh, uh, includes the, the challenges faced by tenants across this community. We know we face an important um, more end of moratorium on tenant evictions coming up here soon. And so we wanted to provide an update on the prospects for relief for those who are facing eviction at this um, very, very challenging time. So we're joined uh, today by Memphis Area Legal Services. We're also joined by Neighborhood Preservation, Inc. And although we're not joined by the University of Memphis uh, Law School Clinic, we do want to give them a shout out because they've been an instrumental uh, partner in this process. So with that said, at this time, I'd like to welcome to the podium Steve Barlow from Neighborhood Preservation, Inc. Hello. Thank you, Mayor Harris. I'm Steve Barlow with Neighborhood Preservation, Inc., which directed the eviction settlement program. Even in the best of times, evictions disrupt families, their jobs, schools, and transportation. The pandemic has brought renewed attention and urgency to the already severe housing affordability and stability challenges in our community. Rental property owners are suffering too, as many previously stable tenants are now unable to pay. The eviction settlement program funded by the CARES Act through Shelby County and the City of Memphis provided funds to rental property owners and free legal assistance to keep families most at risk of eviction stable in their rental homes and apartments. Over a five month period in 2020, the eviction settlement program stopped 1,155 evictions and paid $1.8 million to rental property owners. Volunteer lawyers and law students provided advice and negotiating services to stabilize housing for families most at risk. We established close working relationships with the eviction courts and with rental property owners and their lawyers. We set up high levels of eviction data access and established automated intake. Many received financial and housing counseling services. Overall, the program was a success thanks to the commitment and hard work of our partners and many volunteers. The challenge continues. Despite court closures and the federal eviction moratorium, more than 200 eviction cases have already been filed in January of 2021. There will be additional resources for rent relief and utility assistance in Memphis and Shelby County. And more information on new programs will be available in the next few weeks. Meanwhile, if you are facing eviction or concerned that you may soon be, the Center for Disease Control Eviction Moratorium may apply to you. If it does, you must complete and deliver a CDC letter to your landlord in order to be covered. Visit covid19evictionforms.com to learn more. That's covid19evictionforms.com. I would like to thank our partners, the University of Memphis School of Law, Memphis Area Legal Services, United Housing, Innovate Memphis, and the United States Digital Response. Thank you. And I'd like to hand it over now to Cindy Edingoff, CEO of Memphis Area Legal Services, to talk more about the impressive volunteer lawyer effort that came together to support this program. Thanks, Steve. Well, the eviction settlement program was a partnership, and it's a perfect example of how well a partnership can work. Uh, with the Neighborhood Preservation uh, Inc., the law school and our other partners, we were able, through Memphis Area Legal Services Private Attorney Involvement Unit, to recruit volunteers. And I can say that those volunteers provided a service that we would not have otherwise been able to provide. Um, there are certainly still people who are in need. We do have that CDC certificate on the MALS website, which is www dot m-a-l-s dot m-a-l-s-i sorry dot o-r-g the other thing is that mouse currently has a little money and we are negotiating with landlords that money is um, it's certainly not the money that we had through the eviction settlement program but it is our hope that it will be a bridge until we can return to something that looks more like the eviction settlement program that has more robust funding 
uh, in the interim, as Steve had mentioned, for anyone, and I have sort of a little side approach to that as well. I've said this recently on a couple of programs, for anyone who feels that they may be in danger of eviction, that they have not yet received an eviction notice, but they know that their rent is in arrears, um, a word to the wise would be to certainly check. And you can check on the Shelby County General Sessions Court site. You can go to that site, you can look under cases, and you can look by your last name. If your last name is present, there has been a lawsuit filed. And that's very important because in some circumstances, tenants are not aware that a lawsuit has been filed. Whether that is because the notice itself has, has not been received, been taken from their door, been removed in some way, the bottom line is that if you are in arrears on your rent, you do need to be proactive, you do need to check, and you do need to complete one of those forms. Um, if you are in a position where you think that rental assistance would be of benefit to you, Memphis Area Legal Services does at this time have some money, and we would be happy to help you until those funds run out. Um, again, I can't tell you how much we appreciated the opportunity to partner with the City and County Neighborhood Preservation Inc. and the Law School. We certainly hope to be able to continue that partnership. Uh, to be able to maintain housing for our community. And I have the privilege of introducing Dr. Househalter, who will bring us up to speed on the most recent developments with regard to COVID cases. Thank you, Cindy, and thank you, Steve and Mayor Harris. Elisa Househalter, Director of the Shelby County Health Department. Today I'm gonna to give data updates as I usually do and talk about where we are in the course of the pandemic. Then I'm gonna introduce one of our team members that you haven't seen before, Dr. Martin, who's leading our vaccine distribution efforts. I want everyone to get an opportunity to know who she is. And then I will turn it over to Dr. Randolph who will give an update on where we're going with the upcoming health directive. So at the current time we have 78,382 cases that's an increase of 362 over a 24 hour period. That's clearly a decrease um, from what we were experiencing as a result of one, the Christmas holiday surge and the New Year's holiday surge. We are now experiencing a little bit over 500 new cases per day, which is also a decrease. And we're very, very proud to acknowledge as a community that our reproductive rate now is below one. It's at 0.89%. And our positivity rate um, for the week was at 14%, which is still much higher than we want. It is a downward trend from where we were previously. And we had one day where we had a positivity rate at just a little bit over 10%. So in short, we have much to celebrate as a community. Uh, we have reached that plateau and are also beginning to a downward trend. That's a result of all the efforts of everyone in our community. Um, no one of us individually has made a difference. We've all done this. It's been very difficult work. But I want to reinforce there is still much work ahead of us. We have a long way to go before the pandemic is over. So I want to encourage everyone to stay the course and continue all the efforts that we've had underway thus far. I wanna also talk about the other key gating criteria that we look at. Hospital capacity, while we have a, a little bit lower number of admissions, we're still seeing some admissions that are a result of the holiday surge, but the hospitals are um, really maintaining and able to serve the community and their patients uh, by making adjustments. So again, wanna encourage people, if you need hospital care, please seek that out. I also want to remind everyone that we do have monoclonal antibody treatment available here in Shelby County. Both Baptist and Methodist offer that treatment, and it's especially important for people over 65 or individuals over 50 who have um, other health conditions such as cardiac disease or respiratory disease. For those who are eligible for monoclonal antibody treatment, if you get treatment early, it actually is known to reduce hospitalizations. So if you're diagnosed with COVID and um, fall in the categories that I just mentioned, please talk with your healthcare provider about seeking early treatment that can again reduce hospitalization. 
We have plenty of testing capacity and our testing numbers have gone down a little bit since the holiday. So I want to remind everyone to know your status, get tested. And that's particularly important for people under 40 who may um, be more likely to be asymptomatic, but also are out and about in the world. So really encourage testing. And lastly, I want to talk about public health capacity. We are continuing to do a significant amount of surveillance, but we're also working closely with Dr. Jane in the laboratories to do surveillance around the B117 variant, or many of you know it as the UK variant. We know that strain um, actually is more transmissible than what we're currently experiencing in Shelby County. And that actually can impact our pandemic significantly. So we're working with the labs to do genotyping of different specimens so that as soon as we have that first variant, we're able to take immediate action at the individual and family level to reduce spread of that variant in our community. We're continuing our case investigations and contact tracing, but we're also launching uh, some technology where we can do much of the interviewing via text and also doing that in partnership with the labs so that we can get people isolated and quarantined much more quickly. And last, we're focusing much of our efforts and will for many months to come on vaccine distribution. And so with that noted, I really wanted everyone to meet Dr. Judy Martin. She's our chief of nursing, but also the lead for our vaccine distribution. She's going to introduce herself and then give you an update on how many vaccines we've given thus far and then turn it over to Dr. Randolph. So Judy, if you'll join me, please. Good afternoon. I am Dr. Judy, Judy Martin, uh, Shelby County Health Department. I'm really pleased uh, to have this opportunity to work with uh, the vaccine campaign for the coming year. I'd like to report that to date uh, in Shelby County from the health department side, we've administered a total of 13,335 doses. And that was as of the end of day on Saturday. We expect this to pick up quite a bit. And I'll just offer, if I may, the shot line telephone number because a number of people have questions about how to get an appointment. That number is 901-222-SHOT. 901-222-SHOT. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Martin, Dr. Househalter, Mayor, ha Mayor Harris. Greetings, fellow citizens of Shelby County. I'm Dr. Bruce Randolph, I'm the health officer. I'd like to just um, first thank you, fellow citizens, for your uh, cooperation, your compliance. Uh, we have made progress as Dr. Househalter has mentioned, we've plateaued and actually are showing a downward trend. And that's the result of you uh, being responsible, doing what's necessary to keep all of us safe. And I just want to take this opportunity to just thank you and encourage you to continue doing what you're doing so we can continue this downward trend. With that being said, as you may well know and have been anticipating, that the current health directive, number 16, and the Safer at Home health order uh, is due to expire on uh, the 22nd of this month, which is Friday. And so tomorrow we will be issuing the health directive number 17 which will uh, take effect on Saturday, the uh, January 23rd. And I just want to give you a preview of some of the changes that um, will occur in this directive. One thing I want to emphasize is that this directive place a lot of emphasis on personal responsibility and the importance of you as an individual, as a family member and community member 
doing your part in making sure that we continue to remain safe and continue to progress. Now, we have the vaccine, and certainly we encourage everyone to receive the vaccine when it is available to you. But understand that the vaccine still does not eliminate the need for us to continue the individual safety measures that we have outlined in this health directive number 17. I encourage every citizen to go to our website, Chevy, uh, community, dot community and obtain your personal copy of this health directive because it points out things that you as an individual as well as you as a business owner or service provider should follow. Examples of some of the major highlights of this change is that first of all, all businesses uh, and services are uh, permitted to operate in accordance to the safety measures outlined in this health directive. The Safer at Home Health Order ends uh, after the 22nd of uh, this month. With that, still there are restrictions on gathering in accordance to the ex uh, executive order by the governor, you are still uh, restricted in the number of people who can gather. Even in terms of restaurants, we are still limiting the number of people who are seated at a table. No more than six, you must be separated six feet apart. The number of people who are allowed in a facility it will be determined by the number of people that can be separated six feet apart and no groups larger than six. The other aspect of this health directive when it comes to restaurants, whether they're full service or limited service or other establishments, is that uh, the indoor capacity is 50%. We're increasing it from 25% to 50%. However, we also are still requiring that everyone wear a mask uh, at all times except when you're actually seated and in the process of eating and drinking. As it relates to live entertainment, it is permitted. However, the performer must be 18 feet apart. The uh, other members of the uh, band must be at least six feet apart or separated by some barrier. No dancing is allowed indoors. Outdoor dancing is permitted if it is among people of the same household and they're separated six feet apart. Smoking indoors is, pro is prohibited as well as vaping, uh, smoking the hookah. Other examples of some of the uh, changes uh, are some of the things that still remain in place, the requirement of facial masks uh, when uh, engaging in all other activity uh, including going to uh, gyms and fitness centers. I will uh, stop here and entertain any other questions. One other thing let me add first though. The service hours are still limited to 10 o'clock p.m. Uh, curbside and uh, to go is uh, carry out is still uh, open but we will maintain the uh, hours of indoor dining uh, services to uh, 10 o'clock, and there are not to exceed more than two hours per person. With that, I'll stop and entertain any questions that uh, you may have. Kelly Roberts, WMC. Good afternoon. Um, my first question is about vaccines and that second dose again. Um, I know that a lot of people have been wondering um, when they'll get that second dose. And I know that um, those Moderna vaccines by the health department were first administered, I believe, on the 28th of December. So that 28-day period recommended by the FDA would be about this weekend. 
any updates on setting up that second site for those waiting for the second dose um, or anything more that you can give information wise to those still waiting um, to hear about when they should go get the second dose. Okay, I'm going to uh, let Dr. House Hall to answer that. So yeah, that's a great question. We are currently in negotiations to pick the best site to be able to administer those vaccines. And so should have an announcement by the latest probably on Thursday, but likely before that. We um, know that we have about 9,500 people that receive vaccines in that first round. So we wanna make sure that we're able to deliver all 9,500 of those within a, a week. So I encourage people to continue to go to shelby.community for information. We will also make announcements through our daily updates and they can also call the 901-222 shot. And your follow-up, please. Yes. Um Based on the state vaccine dashboard, it says under 2% of the uh, community here has been vaccinated, which is um, a little lower than um, m most of the counties in the state. I wanted to see, is that correct, that 1.9% um, being reported to the state of people in Shelby County that have been vaccinated? Do you expect, is there a lag? Um, because it looks like we have the lowest um, percentage of people vaccinated in the state at this point, according to that information available on the state dashboard. So two things. One, there is a lag. So the data has to be entered in the tennis system and you have a variety of providers entering into tennis. That includes the health department, the healthcare systems. The pharmacies actually enter in a system called Tiberius that then connects over to tennis and then we do know the Veterans Administration either has or will shortly begin giving vaccine and I'm not sure that they're actually linked to tennis. So there will be some delays between what is in tennis and what's been given locally. Through the task force, we will give updates weekly on what each organization is reporting as having um, being given as first or second dose so that that will be a more accurate number moving forward. The other is when you look at percentage of overall population, we have the largest population to vaccinate. So um, it is gonna take us longer to get those percentages up just because our population is so, so great. We also know that um, the state is looking at opportunities to do larger vaccine sites in partnership with us once we know the Biden administration's plan for increasing supply of vaccine. So continue to pay attention and continue to ask the questions. Thank you. Siobhan Riley, Fox 13. Siobhan, I think you're uh, self-muted. Sorry. Can you talk a little bit about the people who have been getting vaccinated? Have there been any major reports of reactions to any of those vaccines here locally? No. And everyone's encouraged to sign up for something called V-SAFE through the Centers for Disease Control. That also allows reporting at the federal level so that if there are major incidents that are not really within our own system, that's reported at the federal level. But no, at the current time, there have not been um, significant reactions reported locally. Okay, and lastly, can you just talk about your businesses? Are there, have there been any businesses that have not been in compliance? recently? So, um, you know, we update on Shelby.community, those businesses that have been closed. And so I would encourage people to go to that site and look. I actually do not have an update from this past weekend. So I'm not aware at the moment of any closures over the weekend. But if that's different information than what I have currently, we can report that out tomorrow. Fred Broders, Local 24. Thanks, Dr. Houseoffer. Good afternoon. Kind of segueing off Kelly's uh, second question, uh, not to be not to be political, but um, what you've reviewed from the incoming administration's vaccine plan, if it does pan out as they hope, um, what differences, positive changes do you anticipate Shelby County potentially benefiting from as we go into the spring with the vaccine? I think two things. Um, one is predictability, and I had said previously, predictability is critical. It's very difficult to plan 
vaccine pods, particularly when you're trying to move thousands of people through if you don't have predictability. Uh, we actually were getting more predictability towards the end of the Trump administration, but we anticipate that will continue um, as Biden takes office. And then the second is a larger amount of doses coming locally so that we can get those, um, um, as everyone says, shots in arms very quickly. And that's going to be critical to us getting our proportion of our population vaccinated. Thanks, Dr. House. Also, and as a follow up, I know um, this, these couple of weeks in January, it's 8,900 uh, doses a week. Uh, realistically, um, I, first, uh, when do you expect to know the February weekly allotments from the state? And is there uh, any kind of ballpark reasonable potential increase of the weekly allotments? So we do anticipate there will be increases. Um, what those exact numbers are, we don't know currently. Some of the estimates really from the federal level is it's going to take a couple weeks for the adjustment from one administration to another. And so I anticipate we'll get revised updates throughout the uh, month of February, but we are currently at a place that Dr. Martin or uh, Dr. Bruce, our pharmacist, can place an order weekly, and we will know generally by Friday or Saturday what our allotment is for the upcoming week. I don't know what it'll be every week in February, but we know week to week what that's going to be um, by the end of the week or the weekend. So that's positive as well. You can also anticipate we will make adjustments in our vaccine sites. Uh, we have some contracts in process so that we can have more sites throughout the community. We're also looking to uh, be able to offer vaccine at our commodity site for seniors that come through that program and then to partner with the city and some of the other municipalities to have sites. So the more we know what vaccine we're getting, we can begin to expand to those other sites so that it makes it more accessible for the public in general. Michaela Watts, Commercial Appeal. Yes, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I first had a question about evictions for uh, the officials that are here to talk about that. I think Steve's, um, gonna, Steve's gonna join us. Over the past few weeks, I've been trying to determine what resources are available for funding relief and for rent relief. Um, and it doesn't really seem that anyone has a clear sense of upcoming federal funding. And so I just wanted to ask why that is and if we can expect to see a hard dollar amount come down the, the, the information pipeline soon. That's a great question. And uh, as I said in my comments, uh, there will be, uh, within several weeks, we expect to have a very clear picture. Uh, the uh, creation of the program uh, in the federal bill in December uh, definitely set aside funds for all of the states uh, for rent and utility relief. Uh, however, um, I actually, on, on the side over here, I was just reading through a, a recent Department of Treasury announcement about how these funds are to be deployed. There are a lot of open questions. Um, it's very clear that more resources will be coming to Memphis and Shelby County directly, uh, but the details of how that will be rolled out uh, are unclear. One thing I can emphasize is that the foundation that we built during the eviction settlement program uh, coalition uh, which include the legal services and uh, also uh, close coordination with MIFA and uh, other uh, community service agencies uh, will allow us to start uh, with a little bit of a head start on this new program because we've already built something collaboratively and I think that uh, we'll be able to announce a, a robust uh, community-wide program with a lot of uh, community partners who know how to do this kind of work. Great, thank you. And I have a quick follow-up question um, about the youth variant for either Dr. Househalter or Dr. Randolph. Um, at the beginning of the pandemic, when COVID was just making its way into Shelby County, we went into a strict uh, sort of shelter in place order to try and prevent that community spread. If the uh, UK variant is detected, will we see the same sense of urgency in uh, imposing restrictions to try and stop that variant in its tracks? Or um, is it a little too much like the toothpaste already being completely out of the tube? Yeah, I wouldn't compare it to the toothpaste being out of the tube. 
you should expect what we saw at the very beginning of the pandemic. And I will remind people before there were the safer at home orders, we actually were very targeted on those individuals who were cases. And I'm speaking specifically to the health department. When we made recommendations to do a safer at home order, it was when we reached that point of community spread. And that wasn't initially, that was further along. It wasn't in March when we had our first case. So we would do very similar um, actions here. It's important that the labs report to us directly and they're gonna call us if they have even what's a suspicion of a variant. So there are some key markers that let us know the likelihood that uh, one of the specimens is the, the UK variant. When that happens, the labs call us and then we will deploy a strike team to focus on that individual and their immediate contacts, which would be family members as well as work-related contacts and get those individuals quarantined quickly and to do regular testing of those individuals with the goal of reducing the likelihood of community transmission. I really can't um, underscore enough the importance of being able to do the genotyping locally if we send a specimen from Shelby County to the Centers for Disease Control, it could take up to two weeks for us to know if that specimen is a UK variant. But because we have labs locally that have partnered well and are um, engaged in innovation, we will actually be able to fingerprint locally. So we believe collectively that we can take action at the individual and contact level first and try to mitigate or avoid moving into community level interventions. However, with that noted, if there becomes widespread transmission of the UK variant, we may have to take additional action. So one of the key things for the public to take away is really it is important to get tested. The more people we get tested, the more specimens we can look at, and then if we have a variant that shows up, we will know that sooner rather than later. And then do you have a follow-up? That, that was your follow-up, sorry. Jane Roberts, Daily Memphian. Jane, I think you're self-muted. Did you receive more vaccine last week and maybe holding it till February to give the second doses? And then I have a follow up. So I actually wouldn't more use the term holding. We have received um, what is our second dose vaccine. We're not able to administer that yet because we haven't reached the 28 day window. Uh, we will be administering that dose um, likely the first week of February, but we're also looking for other opportunities to potentially begin that as early as the last week of January. And then my follow-up is, we're hearing that a number of people are missing their appointments. Can you shed some light on what percentage and what you're doing to sort of head off wasted vaccine? Uh, so first off, I, I really wanna stress to the community, there is no wasted vaccine in Shelby County. Uh, one of the things that we have all really focused closely on is using every dose that comes to every facility, whether it's the health department, or the healthcare systems. So there won't be waste locally. Uh, there's a variety of strategies we put in place to reduce waste. One, um, as a clinical person, uh, we always know that there's a proportion of individuals who will show up that didn't have an appointment and a proportion of people who won't show up when they did have an appointment. So you have to schedule enough people in that hour or two hour block to accommodate for your projected no-shows. You also know that people may show up late and outside of their appointment time. So it's really constant monitoring of what's happening throughout the day. If for any reason, and this happened the very first week, we saw that there were lags in people coming in, we opened it up to other groups to allow them to come through. And the specific example is the funeral directors and mortuary service providers they were sent a, a very specific notice that they could come and that was to reduce waste um, or potential waste. The other is that we will keep a running list of individuals who are eligible but um, can come on very short notice to get vaccine if we notice at the end of the day we have any vaccine that needs to be utilized. Looks 
like we've now gotten to every outlet that had a question. Are there any closing messages today? Just want to reinforce um, Dr. Randolph's comments. We want to say thank you to the public. We know this has been a very difficult um, year. March will mark our, our full year since our first case, and we know we won't be through the pandemic at that point. We are doing much better now and doing much better than many other communities post holiday surge and that's because of all the efforts locally so thank you on behalf of the health department as well as uh, the members of the joint task force thank you thanks everyone we'll see you back here on thursday